I'm going to read you a quote from Lost Women of the Bible by Carolyn Custis James. At her lowest point, she is rounded up like cattle with the other young girls without regard to her as a person. At her highest, she sits at the apex of world power and wields a staggering level of influence on international affairs. Her story is truly big enough to contain every woman's story. The story of Esther. It takes place during the reign of King Xerxes of Persia, primarily in the king's palace of Susa, the capital of the Persian Empire. And it's around 465 BC. It's more than 100 years after the Babylonian captivity and just over 50 years since the first group of exiles returned to Jerusalem. But many Jews still remained in Persia. They're part of the diaspora. They're, they're a people who had become established in their new home in Persia. Or perhaps they were afraid to make what was a dangerous journey back to Jerusalem. Either way, thousands, thousands remained. And Esther's family is a part of that group. So, as you know, Esther is orphaned as a, as a little girl, and then she's adopted by her older cousin Mordecai. So we're going to remember the story together tonight, and we're going to mine it to see what God might have for us. So now let's pray. Jesus, your word is life. Your word is truth. You are life. You are truth. And we come underneath you tonight, Jesus. We come together in the name of Jesus to seek your heart. We come to women at the well and gather as, as a group who long for more of you, who are thirsty for more of you, and who know that more is available. So I ask that you would come tonight with your more. I pray that you would overflow and spill into the hearts of the women here that have come to encounter your love, to hear from you, Jesus. Lord, I pray you would open up our ears as one being taught and that what you have for each woman, whether I say it or not, she would receive it from you. Jesus, we cover this place with your blood. We consecrate the atmosphere, the room, and ourselves to your kingdom. And even now, we settle ourselves. I settle myself, Jesus. <sighs> the people, the things, the concerns that we carry, Jesus, we just imagine ourselves handing them over to you to tend a while. We are here for you at your invitation. Thank you that you came before us. We love you, and we pray in Jesus' name. So a story and a sound of a precious baby. One day, the king of Persia threw a lavish party. And okay, it's not one day. One day he may have thought of throwing this party, but this is a party that's going to last for six months. This is a banquet for every noble in his land. And after the six-month party, he throws a six-week party for every man in Susa. Now, Xerxes is a powerful king. His kingdom reigns from India to the Sudan. Okay, just imagine it. There's over 127 provinces. So you know the story. On the last day of the six-month festival, Xerxes calls for his queen, Vashti. He wants her to come and to parade her beauty in front of all of the nobles. He wants to show her off. And Vashti refuses. Actually, it is a command that is way beneath the dignity of a queen. And had she obeyed, she would have been relegated to the status of a concubine. She refuses. Xerxes is so embarrassed in front of everyone and angry. You know what he does next. He banishes Vashti from his presence forever. Four years later, he's lonely, and he misses her. So 
his very unhelpful counselors suggest a grand idea, that he hold a royal beauty pageant. They suggest that every gorgeous virgin in the entire kingdom be rounded up and then undergo a 12-month protocol of beauty treatments to prepare them for one night with him. And whatever young woman pleased him the most, she would be queen. Now you can imagine that Xerxes thought this was a very good idea. And he did. But I don't want to rush over this for a second. Because this is appalling. And this happened. This is real. Young women, girls, beloved daughters are rounded up against their will to become a concubine. You can imagine the parents that were just desperate, trying to hide their daughters, trying to prevent this from happening to them. Now, maybe there was a couple that thought this might be a great honor, but can you imagine what Mordecai thought? The last thing he would want would be for his beloved adopted daughter to become a concubine to a pagan king. You can imagine him desperately praying that she not be taken. And what about Esther? Did she have dreams for her life? Is this what she imagined might happen to her? Did Mordecai have dreams for her life? I mean, I can imagine him wanting her to get married, live next door, and him being a grandfather actively engaged in the dailies of their life. And we know, we know his concern and his love for her and his desperation because after she's taken to the palace and undergoing the 12-month protocol, he is often found pacing back and forth in front of the palace gates, desperate for word of her. Many years ago, Lynn Wynn pulled back the curtain for me on what this might have been like for a young woman. And Esther, these girls, they're about 14. Because apart from the story, the idea of being pampered, massaged, oil and beauty treatments, lotions, all this kind of stuff for 12 months, okay, that part sounds pretty good. But not when it's all for one night to give your virginity to a stranger, a powerful stranger who has the authority to banish you. And if you please him, you will be sent to the house of concubines where you will spend the rest of your life waiting with hope that he might call you. And if you are the woman you may be picked to be his queen, but all the while you know it happened to the other one. Esther complied with the treatments, by the way. We don't um, hear that she resisted being taken. Um, she followed Mordecai's command that she hide her Jewish heritage. Esther means hidden. She's not a strong believer like Daniel. Daniel, she doesn't say no. She will give herself to the pagan king. She's not even like Mordecai, who later in the story refuses to, to kneel to a man. She is not a heroine of the faith. Not yet. She is an imperfect woman with character flaws. God moves mountains through imperfect women with character flaws. Thank goodness. <laughs> and we can have mercy on Esther, right? She's, she's young. She's a voiceless woman who was taught to obey. She's raised in the ancient patriarchal society where her entire value is based on her relationship with men. She is told that her worth comes from her appearance and her ability to please men. It is the message. And she was taught, like we have been taught, that her worth was commensurate with her outward appearance based on what society's current standards were. Esther does what she's told. 
She follows Mordecai's command. She obeys Haggai the eunuch later as he instructs her what to bring into the king's chambers when it's her turn. So she is young. She's alone. She is frightened. What would this have been like for Esther? To help us in our imagination with this, I'm going to show a scene compilation from the old movie, Anna and the King. This is a scene where a young woman has been given to the king to give him her virginity and to join his harem of concubines. Let's watch this. I think it helps. Tupton doesn't want to be there. We can imagine that Esther doesn't want to be there either. And as you know, Esther pleased the king more than any other woman, and she was chosen for the throne. And her cousin Mordecai received a small position in the Persian court. <coughs> Excuse me. But like every good story, the intrigue continues. Mordecai soon uncovers a plot to assassinate the king. So he tells it to Esther, who tells it to Xerxes, and the plot is thwarted. And Mordecai's act of kindness is recorded in the annals of the king. And at this time, the highest official in the king's court is a man named Haman. He is a wicked man, he is vengeful, and he is egotistical, and he is a Canaanite. He's actually an Amalekite. And Jewish readers of Esther would immediately recognize him as the enemy in big, bold, red letters. See, the ongoing conflict between Israel and the Amalekites began at the Exodus and continued throughout their history through the time of Esther. The Amalekites were the very first to attack the Jewish people after their deliverance from Egypt. So the Amalekites were viewed, and the author of Esther views them as the epitome of all the powers of the world arrayed against God's people. Hey, let me say that again, just so you know, just as a picture, because we want to find our story in Esther's story. They are representative, he is representative, of all the powers of the world arrayed against God's people. Haman hated the Jews, and he hated Mordecai especially because earlier in the story I alluded to there was an edict that everyone had to bow and kneel to Haman, and Mordecai wouldn't do it. So what is Haman, a vengeful, egotistical man, supposed to do? Well, he decides to have every Jew in Persia killed. That's what he's going to do. At this time, Esther's now been queen for five years. So we've just, we've just gone a couple of verses, but she's got five years under her belt now. Anyway, the king is, is rash. Uh, we've already seen that he's prone to rash decisions. He's easily swayed, and he agrees for the Jews to be annihilated. To pick the month that it's going to happen, Haman throws dice called Pur, and that's where the Jewish festival Purim derives its name. He throws the dice, poor, to decide when they're going to be annihilated. And I think it's a good thing. It came like at the end of the year. It wasn't in two months. It was like in ten months from when it started. So, meanwhile, Mordecai learns of the plot again. And he comes to Esther to tell her of it. And he challenges her with these famous words. Do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place, but you and your father's family will perish. And who knows but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. For such a time as this. I wonder how Esther felt about that when he told her that. Did she feel the weight of the world on her shoulders. It was up to her. Have you ever felt the weight of the world on your shoulders? I'm sure you have. 
we all have. Life situations, work situations, family, friends, health, maybe even the state of the nation or the state of the world can weigh our hearts down. We have our cares. We can feel overwhelmed, buried. Maybe you are now feeling that. Certainly you have felt it. Friends, I want to remind you tonight that Jesus knows what it's like to be buried. He knows what it's like. And he knows what it is to resurrect. He rose. And because of him, we can too. Again, from Lost Women of the Bible. But life is full, isn't it, of unpredictable twists and turns. Long lulls, disappointments, tragedies, and big breaks that push us out of the shadows and force us to summon up our courage, strength, and gifts we never even knew we had. This situation called for Esther to think, to strategize, to exercise courage, to stand on her own two feet, and to rely solely upon her God. When the weight of the future was placed on Esther, it very well could have crushed her. The weight of her people, and we're talking thousands and thousands of people, that weight could have crushed her. I'm sure she was tested. I'm going to show one more scene tonight. This one is from the old television show, Friday Night Lights. This was a scene that I stumbled upon, and a little clarification I show scenes sometimes from things. I'm not recommending the entire thing. This is a, this is a good clip. <laughs> this takes place in Texas. With Texas, high school football is everything. And what has just occurred is their star quarterback, the best quarterback they have ever had or seen, scouts are there watching him. Well, he suffered a massive tackle, <clears throat> and afterwards he didn't get up. <coughs> he can't move. He's carried off in a stretcher. He, he can't feel his legs. So the underdog quarterback, the one who has never played in his life, is called to take his place. He has three plays for the end of the game, and the first two he fumbles badly. He throws a pass into his teammate's helmet. It's bad. But then it's the third play. Let's watch this. I don't know what your story is or what you've lived. This particular story may be one that you've lived. We all suffer. We all get tested and tried and pushed and crushed. And it is true that it calls us to look inside. But for the believer, we look inside, and that's where Jesus dwells. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives in us. Esther was tested. Esther felt the weight of the world. Her Jewish name is Hadassah. It's a name that means myrtle. And myrtle is a plant that releases its fragrance when it is crushed. Esther. Hadassah, she released a beautiful fragrance that can only come from extraordinary trust in hard circumstances. Because what she did next was extraordinary. She rose. She no longer asked what it was she should do. She commanded Mordecai to instruct all of the Jews to fast and to pray for deliverance. Esther rose up with courage, with determination. She's no longer the frightened young girl that she was five years ago. She is a queen in every sense of the world. And so as such, she looks to her God. That's what we're meant to do in the times of our crushing. And when we do that, the fragrance that is released is a holy aroma to our king and an alluring fragrance to those around us. 
one of the much talked about features of this book is how God is never mentioned, right? They, they never mention God. He's alluded to, but the author deliberately doesn't mention God. And it highlights the fact even that God is actively at work behind the scenes, that his sovereignty is key, highlighted by the total absence of the mention of him. Esther rises with courage, but also with wisdom and with cunning. She's become a cunning woman. She has studied the courts. She understands palace protocol. She knows how the mind of the king works. So she devises the plan, aware of the risk, aware of the risk that if you enter into the king's presence without being summoned, it's punishable by immediate death unless he extend his scepter to you, in which case you get to approach him with your request. Esther knew this, and she was brave, and she approached the king. He extends his scepter. He's, he is, I don't know what he's feeling, that she risked this to come talk to him, but you know what he says, whatever you want, I'll give it to you, up to half my kingdom, right? This king. So... Half of my kingdom is available to you. And so she asks him to dinner. Would you, would you come? You and Haman come to a banquet. I'd like to throw you the next night. And they do. She invites them to come to the dinner. Well, at the dinner, he wants to know why he's there. Why did you invite me to dinner? What, what do you really want? And you can have it, my beautiful queen. You can have whatever you want up to half my kingdom. And he, she says, will you come to dinner tomorrow night? Sure, Esther. In between. We're in between now. They've had their banquet. They're going to come the next night. And um, Xerxes couldn't sleep. So in order to put him to sleep, he commands that the palace records be read to him. And as they are, he is reminded that Mordecai saved his life, but he had done nothing to thank him. So the next day, he orders Haman to lead Mordecai around on the king's horse, wearing the king's robe, praising him, which kills Haman. So this, this whole book, it's full of parallels, and it's full of ironic twists and turns. And so what is Haman to do then? after being humiliated, but have a scaffold built with which he's going to hang Mordecai on. But we're going to pause here a second. I want to ponder a little bit what, what did Esther look like to these people, to Xerxes, the most powerful king that has existed at this point, to Haman, his highest official, when she comes and what she wants is time with them. I want to I want to have you to dinner. Was she a silly woman? Did they look at her as just a pretty ornament, ornament or a lovely woman to look at and enjoy? Do you think either one of them saw a world changer, a life saver, a threat to evil, a powerful woman to be contended with? A cunning woman? She was an azer. What do you think people see when they see you? Do they see into the depths? Probably not. Most people see the outside. It's God that looks at the heart. He sees the depth. People in your life see what you are willing to show. They see how you live. They see what you offer. They see your beliefs, your choices, and the way that you love. People are watching you. They are taking notice. But other people's opinions, good or bad, are not meant to define you or to burden you. People will try, and they have tried in your past. They've tried to tell you what value you have as a woman or what value you don't have as a woman. I like what Lisa Nichols says. She says, other people's perception of you ain't none of your business. 
I know. I really like that. We can't let other people's opinions of us determine our opinion of us. Now, yes, we want to listen to constructive, loving words of correction or, or to those we trust who gently and carefully need to point out a weakness that we have. But even so, don't let that take you out. Because it could have taken Esther out. It could have immobilized her with fear. She could have quaked under the accusation of diminishment and unqualified. But she didn't. She had been valued solely by, for her appearance, but she could say, like we can say for the ways that we have been valued, this is not who I am. I am more than this. Your opinion of me does not define who I am. I belong to God. The only opinion that matters is his. Esther was a queen in every sense of the word. She was created to rule. Gal, so are you. I'm talking to a room full of world changers, of women who are threats to evil, of women who need to be contended with, powerful women who are azers. Esther was wise and savvy, and everything she, that she had been through, it had prepared her for this. And I want to tell you that everything that you have been through, every tear you've cried, every prayer you've prayed, every loss you have suffered has prepared you for your next best season, for your next higher calling. Esther rose to the occasion, and she shows us that we can too. She's an ordinary woman. She's a woman like us. She was bold enough, brave enough, courageous enough to rise. She says, if I perish, I perish. You can picture her face like flint, like Jesus' face was set like flint when he faced Jerusalem. So at the banquet... The second night, eventually Esther reve reveals her Jewish heritage and Haman's plot to kill her and all of her people and to hang Mordecai. And in a rage, the king orders that Haman be hung on the gallows instead. And then Mordecai is promoted to Haman's high position. But it's because of Esther's ongoing wisdom and intervention that the Jews were granted protection from the day that they were to be annihilated. Actually, they were granted the right to defend themselves, but also to take the offense against their enemies. And literally thousands of their enemies are killed on the day that Haman had devised for them to be destroyed. That's why the Jews today still celebrate for two days the festival of Purim. Listen, gals, God is going to get it done. But he needs us to play our part. Our God chooses to move and to act through imperfect people with character flaws. So what has God placed in front of you to do? What has he placed in front of you to offer? You are the perfect woman for the job with Jesus. Ultimately, your skills, your work, your, your gifts, they aren't about you. They're about us. See, we need you. We all need each other. We need you to show up and play your part. Maybe, maybe you don't know what your next season holds. Most of us don't. Or maybe you think you're done and there isn't anything else for you to be a part of. Or maybe... You, your dreams and desires have had to be put on hold for so long that you're letting them fall by the wayside. Don't put a period where God has put a comma. You have way more life to live. And you are meant to live 
a brave life. But girls, you're not the brave one. You are in communion with the brave one who has promised that he will be your strength. He will supply all of our needs. In Deuteronomy 31, 6, famously, he says, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified of them, for it is the Lord your God who goes with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. That promise is for us. Okay, a little P.S. You can't live a brave life without disappointing some people. It's going to happen. But the people who are rooting for you, who are cheering for you, who are championing you, won't be. God never is. He is never disappointed in you. Brene Brown says that if you are brave long enough, you will fail. And the response is, so what? So what? Failure is really just life telling you to go a different direction. It shows that you tried. You showed up. It's information. It's not a sentence on your identity. It's a part of being alive. We're human. We're going to fail. It doesn't mean we are a failure. And we will never succeed if we're too afraid to try. So think again. Where is God calling you? Maybe it's deeper into a relationship. Where is your for such a time as this? Because what if Esther hadn't tried? Haman's edict in the book of Esther is the final effort in the Old Testament to destroy the Jewish people. If Esther hadn't intervened and if God hadn't intervened through her, they would have been annihilated. There are things that come after us. We have an enemy that wants to destroy us, just as they had an enemy that wanted to destroy them. I want to read Colossians 2, 13 through 15. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Jesus has overcome our every enemy. Esther's enemies were destroyed. This woman who was part of a hated minority, a voiceless woman who had no value on her own, who was to be seen and not heard. Who was Esther to become a deliverer of her people? I mean, you can, you can imagine someone in the court learning of her plan and asking her that question. Who do you think you are? Right? And the question is generally an attempt to shame the person to back down. The answer is supposed to be, no, I'm no one. I was thinking too highly of myself. But that is not the true answer, is it? That's not who Esther was. And who did she think she was? Was she thought she was royalty, which she was. She was a woman placed in the time and place for God's purposes. She was an azer, not afraid to lay her life down on behalf of others. We get mocked by the enemy saying, who do you think you are? Who do you think you are to have the desires that you do, the dreams you do? Well, you are royalty. That's who you are. You are a woman placed in a time and a place now for God's purposes. You are an Azer. You are who he says you are. And the people who see you for who you are, who champion you, they want you to rise. Maya Angelou said, when you see me coming, it ought to make you proud. <laughs> Your life with God, it encourages our life with God's. 
God is our deliverer, and he raises up deliverers. He, he raised up Esther as a deliverer. He raised up Moses and Joshua and Joseph and many others. And through Jesus, we are delivered from death and evil and sin and a meaningless life. Colossians 1, for he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves, in whom we have redemption the forgiveness of sins. God is able to save his children. And God is raising you up in your world to bring his kingdom to bear on a people who are lost without him. Jesus has defeated our every enemy. In the book of Esther, the forces of all the enemy are destroyed. For the Jewish people, they were defeated. Because during, during Israel's conflict with the Immaculites, God had promised them rest. He'd promised it to them beforehand and during. With Haman's defeat, the Jews entered rest. God is able to give his children rest. He's able to give us rest. Rest from our enemies rest from accusations of diminishment and unqualified or overwhelmed or whatever else he's accusing you with. We can rest in Jesus. Thou hast made us for thyself, O Lord, and our heart is restless until it finds its rest in thee, said Augustine of Hippo. Exodus thirty-three fourteen says, The Lord replied, My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. Psalm 91, whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. We're not designed to carry the burdens of the world, the fear, the worry, the anxiety, the pressure, other people's well-being, our callings even. When we do become overloaded, we're instructed in 1 Peter to cast all our cares upon him because he cares for you. To cast means to violently throw, to fling. Not like just cast your cares upon him. It's like cast your cares upon him. I bet there's things that each one of us need to cast. And I bet there's places where we need to rest. Jesus said, and he is saying to you, come away by yourselves and rest a while. There is no true rest if there remains even a shadow of doubt in your belief in a good, trustworthy, living God. A breathing, seeing, moving, fast-acting God, an omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent God. But when we truly believe in him and in his good heart and his heart for us, then we can trust him and then we can rest. We rest in Christ. We rest in what he has accomplished for us. We rest that our sins have been forgiven. We rest that we have been adopted into his family. We rest because we are co-heirs with Christ. We rest because the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives in us. We rest because we have been given the Holy Spirit as a promised seal. And we rest because we get to live in union with God. None of it is on our own. We rest because Though we are not enough, God is more than enough. And we rest because it is Christ who now lives his life through us. We rest because we are not on our own. Ever again, we, are, we belong to God. And only in Christ can our souls fully and finally rest. Spurgeon said, faith is reason at rest in God. Through Esther, God intervened for his people so they could rest. Through Jesus, God intervened for us 
so that we can rest. It actually takes courage to rest. Courage is from the Latin root word heart. And possessing courage, heart, it leads to rest. It's because of Esther's courage that the Jewish people entered their rest. For most people, it takes a great deal of courage to rest, to let go, to trust God. Because in order to rest, we have to trust that God is at work. We have to believe him. It takes courage for me to rest. I'm being invited to a season of rest. I'm actually stepping back from ministry for the rest of the year. I'm going on an extended sabbatical and I have mixed feelings about it. I love this ministry and it's a great honor to be a part of it. I'm privileged to play the role I get to play, but God is calling me to rest and to trust him with all those and all that I love. And so I'm saying yes. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Um, but even after her moments of courage, Esther still had to trust. She had to rest that it was in God's hands. We, we get to rest in him even as we rise to where he is inviting us to go. We're not called up. This isn't the strive harder session. This is, this is in the make it happen session. If I was going to title it, and I will, I think it'll be called Rise and Rest. From a position of rest in the deep heart of God, that's where we can offer. That's where we can live. And we're not surrounded by threats of failing or how it's going to go. It's because we are embraced in union with our Father and living a life of his life through us, a life of love. Where is it going to take you courage to rest? What do you have to trust God with in order to rest? Do you need to trust him with a relationship to rest? Do you need to trust him with your marriage, with your singleness? Do you need to trust him with your health? Do you need to trust him with other people's health? With, do you need to trust him with your future so that you can rest? Do you need to have the courage to trust him with the future of those you love in order to rest? And what's preventing you from resting? because that's where your courage is needed. Is the message of Esther that God has a plan for our lives? Is it that we are given divine moments to alter circumstances? Is it about the power of prayer and fasting? Or that we must stand with courage? Is it that God uses everyone and everything for his divine purposes? Yes, yes, but more. It is a call to trust him, to take heart, to be of good courage, to rise and to rest in his good heart. If the book of Esther teaches us anything, it tells us that God is always moving behind the scenes to work out things for his good purposes. He was moving for them and he's moving for us. He's moving for you, and he's moving for me. Do you need courage? Is he calling you up to a higher level of influence, deeper into calling? Where is God calling you to rest? <laughs> then you need him. Let's pray. Father, there is always more with you. There's always more to discover, more of your heart, more of your love, more of your peace, to discover more of how much you are fighting for us on any given day and every given moment. Thank you that we are never alone. Thank you that you go before us 
and behind us, that you precede us, and that our life is not up to us. God, we want to live it in partnership with you. And I pray for each woman tonight that you would reveal to her the places that it is difficult for her to trust you, where it's difficult for her to have her heart be at rest. And I pray you would give her the courage to believe. We ask that you would fill our time of worship and that even in it we would continue on with one of the questions, the many that got, um, that arose tonight. We love you and we look to you, our good Father. In Jesus' name.